my name is uh, Stephen Hart, um, and I'd like to uh, present this uh, program, which is a very exciting program we've got today, uh, which is based on uh, Cynthia Stevens' book. I'd also like to say as well that we'll uh, talk a little bit about the way that we're going to structure this. So um, we will have Cynthia, who will speak a bit about the book uh, at the beginning, uh, the genesis of the book. Then um, I will invite Professor Evelyn Fishburne to make some comments about the book. Um, then I'll make a few comments uh, as well about the book. Um, and what? Uh, and then afterwards we'll have the open mic after perhaps we've made a few comments about our own uh, our own presentations or our own points. What we did in our uh, presentations about the book is sort of split things up. Okay, so um, Evie uh, is is looking at the double symmetry and elusiveness. And I'm going to be looking at um, the real Borges translation and the idea of Borges as creator. So those are the uh, uh, two things that we're going to be doing um, with regard to that. And when making your comments afterwards, um, please remember uh, to uh, unmute yourself. Your comments can be obviously in the chat and or raise your virtual hand and then uh, and then you can make your comment and question etc i'd like to now introduce um uh cynthia stevens who's a member of the chartered institute of linguists the association of hispanists of great britain and ireland and the modern humanities research association she studied english and spanish language and literature plus philosophy at the university of newcastle upon tyne graduating in 1978. And she then went to live in Toledo, Spain, where she taught English and was living there during the historic transition to democracy. She then did some research on Jorge Luis Borges at the University of Cambridge, receiving an MLit degree in 1985. Subsequently, subsequently, she published four academic articles on Borges in prestigious journals, including the Modern Language Review, and the Forum for Modern Language Studies, and her background in philosophy, uh, including logic, enabled her to move e easily into a career in software development within British universities and medical schools. After returning to Scotland, where she was born, she became a translator of scientific, technical, and medical documents from Spanish into English, doing this from the seaside town of Dunbar, which is very, 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 very nice place. I visited it, it's absolutely a wonderful place. What a great place to decide to live in, uh, Cynthia. Um, she's now moving into literary translation, but her research on Borges remained with her throughout her life, and I can testify to this. Uh, whenever I would meet up with Cynthia, she would always, always mention uh, Borges, and, and of course I was very much liked reading your articles that you've written over the years, but now, which has now turned into a wonderful book on the great Argentine uh, author. Um, I should also mention that Cynthia is a keen amateur poet, and I've gone to some of her readings as well in Edinburgh, great fun, and also a member of the Dunbar Writers Group. So Cynthia, I wonder if I could ask you now to tell us a bit about where the book came from um, and also, of course, preface that with a, um, a picture of the book. And I do need to say something else as well. For all of you here, um, I think that you should buy this book. OK, you can get 40 percent off if, and also free shipping. I'm reading from the screen, actually, via the promo, promo code, which is on the screen, Borges and the, Enig uh, the Enigma. Um, and there's also in the chat as well. It's an absolutely fantastic book. I will be talking a bit more about it uh, later on um, after Cynthia speaks. And then I will also pass to uh, Professor Evelyn Fishburne. But uh, Cynthia, I wonder if I could ask you to tell us a little bit about where this book came from. Thank you. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I think um, I've got about um, 20 minutes to talk, so you can let me know when I'm getting near the end, uh, Steve. So it's, it's one of these things, it's hard to say, you know, where something started and where it ends. 
It probably started with my grandmother who introduced us all to Robert Louis Stevenson when we were children. Um, and there's a very big um, Robert Louis Stevenson connection here within the family. Um, then um, when I went to Newcastle University, where I had a wonderful time for three years, um, really enjoying studying both English language and literature and Spanish ab initio and philosophy, because I actually had science A levels. Um, and they were so flexible, they let me in, you know, with all the wrong qualifications. <clears throat> and um, I'd like to thank uh, Peter William Evans in particular, uh, because he was the one who introduced me to Borges. And then uh, I went off to Toledo for a couple of years, and then I came back and um, I <coughs> studied, <coughs> did some very cerebral research on Borges in Cambridge, uh, which I loved, actually, loved every minute of it. Uh, but of course, uh, Borges was still alive. And so I knew very little about his life. Um, most of us didn't know very much, but I just had, you know, um, dates and some names, and I wasn't very interested in all this stuff about military ancestors and whatnot, because I didn't really have a hook for it. And, um, you know, I was involved in a different sort of side of his work. Um, um, but I, 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 I followed um, Oscar Pickenheim, his book, which gave, you know, all the details of what, um, um, I'm just checking if I'm getting that right, wait a minute. Uh, uh, Jorge Oscar Pickenheim's Borges a Traves de Sus Libros, which was my Bible, you see, for following uh, what Borges had written. And of course, uh, and he had suppressed his two absolutely excellent, uh, book, three excellent books of essays, early ones. Um, but there were copies in the British Library. Well, it was the British Museum. And I went down for about a week to this wonderful uh, round reading room where Marx had read and Virginia Woolf and all sorts of legendary figures and um, 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 yeah, Louis McNeese wrote this wonderful poem called the British Museum Reading Room. So I went down there um, and there was where I read this article, uh, one of his articles about Sir Thomas Brown. I've still got the notes quite miraculously because we had six house moves in the 1980s. Um, but they survived these notes. And um, I also photocopied the article on Sir Thomas Brown. And this for me was an absolute um, eye opener because then in the Cambridge University Library, I got into all these books and I just saw the more, the deeper I delved, the more I saw and I just got fascinated with it all. And of course I had science background. So that probably was part of the reason I got so interested. And my esteemed supervisor, Lorna Joanna Close, kept suggesting that I might like to do research on his ultraismo avant-garde work in Spain. And I got deeper and deeper into 17th century history of science and medicine. Um, but um, I loved every minute of it. And towards the end of my time in Cambridge, I also discovered his connection. I delved into the 14 volume uh, De Quincey works edited by David Masson in Edinburgh whose daughter, Rosalind Masson, published my great-grandfather, uh, great-grandmother writing about Stevenson. So there's all sorts of things going on, but I, I discovered there was so, such a big connection with De Quincey, and I actually published an article later about that. But if I'd got in there, I would have taken my life over, you see. So um, basically after um, about four years or so there, um, that came to an end. I had to get a job. And um, I went off and became a software developer, which uh, for, had a 15 year career as a software developer and I worked for top medical schools and all this kind of thing. I was in and out of one place or another because if it was like, you know, the, the country of the blind, the one eyed man is king in those days, you know, in the 80s. We knew a little bit. And I had my logic that I'd done, I'd studied in. Newcastle under Mary Midgley's husband, the two Midgley's were the great philosophy people in, in Newcastle. So it was dead easy to become a software developer. Um, so, um, 
And then I worked in St. Andrew's uh, Spanish department of writing software. And that was where Catherine Davies so kindly um, helped me to get my first article published, you see, in the Modern Language Review, first article about Borges. So that was wonderful. Um, and um, then I went on and worked in Liverpool Medical School and Cambridge Medi uh, Clinical School and so on. Um, and then when I was coming back from some terribly important medical conference with thousands of doctors, I think it was either Hamburg or Innsbruck or whatever, I think probably in the airport I bought the, the paperback book, uh, James Goodall's um, book about Borges. And I was reading this on the bus and things on the way back to Cambridge where we were living, so my daughter was going through school, up school there. I couldn't believe, I didn't know anything about his life, you see, but by then he had died. This was around the time of the millennium. So this was terribly interesting, but I was out of all that. So I was complete, I, have, I managed to get four articles published, but then I was completely out of all that because there was too much else going on in my life. I had a whole new career and was bringing up my daughter and um, I just had moved on. Other literature was definitely still always part of my life, you know as was art and film and so on. Um, then, um, yeah, so after, uh, yeah, in, uh, it must have been about 15 years ago, I'm not quite sure of the date, I moved back to Scotland, yeah. Uh, so, and I thought well, I could move home, as it were, to the lovely seaside town near my family. And um, what could I do there? You see, so I thought well, I could do a wee bit of English teaching, which I used to do in Toledo, and maybe do some translation. So, I started translating as well from home. Um, and it was around that time I actually noticed through the power of the internet that some of my articles were getting quite a lot of attention. So I thought, well, maybe I should, you know, get, take up the project again. And then and somehow or other I discovered that the Hispanist Conference, the AHGBI, was having a conference in Stirling, which was just a hop away. So I hopped on the early morning train up to this I stayed in the youth hostel beside the castle. So I had a bit of an adventure in a dorm, you know, with a snoring woman that I didn't even know was in the dorm. And but I really enjoyed this conference. I thought it was super fun because I'd been out of all that, that world for such a long time. And I thought, oh, I loved all this stuff about Lorca and all the other people I'd studied and so on. And I thought, I'm going to go every year to this conference because it gives me a link with my past life, you know. And then someone said, if you go to a conference, you need to give a paper, otherwise no one knows who you are. So then I kept offering a paper every year. And to my great amazement, they kept saying yes, you see. So I did one at the Oxford one and Stephen Hart very kindly invited me onto his panel, which made me look very respectful. And um, I did that one with something to do with autobiography. And then it was one in Galway, and I did one about W.G. Zebelt, who'd, who'd um, used, referred a lot to Borges in Rings of Saturn. And I did one in Exeter about R.S. Thomas, the great poet who I love because I got very involved with poetry. And I did one in Northumbria um, about the, this wonderful find in the National Library of Argentina of all these books belonging to Borges, where he'd annotated you know, the genesis of his stories and whatnot from these, his reading material. And I did one in Leeds about Robert Graves. And I think that was about Robert Graves anyway. Yeah, because Spork is like Graves. But so anyway, there's a lot going on. And yeah, I also joined up to the National Library of Scotland, you see, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing here, just up, a, just a train hop away. And they've got these wonderful resources. So every year I was doing something for this conference. I'd be studying uh, the stuff in there. Sometimes I'd look things up on the internet, like a bit of a detective. And then you get a little bit of the thing on the internet. And then you go and look up the full book in the National Library. Um, so, I, and I really enjoy that because it's such a lovely, lovely place. And all, all the librarians are so friendly and so nice. Um, and, um, so, but I, yeah, as I started to reread Borges, and there was, it wasn't just a matter of rereading, because there was a lot of new stuff came out that I hadn't read before, either because um, it had come out, there was this late stuff, or other things that were being republished that were hidden away, 
sometimes in, in minor places, you know. So I was rereading, and I knew his canonical, what they call the canonical works, very, very well from the past, but it was discovering all these other new things. And then reading his poetry late at night or whatever, and no longer as a young woman in a hurry, uh, you know, his poetry written by an old man, I began to read it very, very differently. And I thought, how could I not have noticed all the emotional side to this? And then because I'd by then read a lot of biographies as well, I began to think there's an awful lot of his own life in this that I just never noticed before. Firstly, because I didn't know anything about his life. And secondly, the sort of the orthodoxy at the time was you weren't, it wasn't really encouraged to sort of look at all that very much. But I just began to think, <clears throat> this, is, this is what it's all about from, from the way I read it, you know. Um, and um, so anyway, at some point I sort of wrote a book, you know, and then I didn't actually think it really was an academic book. I wasn't, but the trouble is that non-academia thinks it's terribly academic and academia thinks it's not academic enough. So then you're in this sort of double bind. And so I'm very, very grateful to, to uh, Tamases, Stephen Hart, um, Scott Mahler, um, Megan Milan, and all the team for, you know, coercing me into, into um, you know, um, uh, making it go through various incarnations, which was not always pleasant from my point of view, sometimes rather painful. But anyway, we seem to have got there, which is the important thing. Um, and, um, you know, a couple of chapters uh, waiting for a new home um, and some other things have sort of, you know, I, I, the thing is that because they're an academic publisher, the book had to be turned into an academic book. Uh, and I've not, I'm not working in academia, so I was probably a bit clueless about that side. Um, but I'm very, very happy the book has now come out and um, it's great. Um, and but yes, yeah, so there's some uh, sort of rambling on here and probably missing out all the important bits. Um, I've not really spoken much about Borges, but a few of the things that I felt uh, that, uh, that sort of, uh, it, yeah, it, basically the main thesis of my book is that Borges' is real life, the real Borges, is actually very much present within his fictions. And this is something I, I've come to believe in recent years, not in the early stage of my research. Um, so, for instance, I write quite a lot about his hereditary blindness and authorial perception, which could, for instance, be represented by Bishop Barclay's idealist vision, so the philosopher. Um, and Borges' relationship with his own father uh, might be hinted uh, at, for instance, um, by an abstract and slightly unreal Herbert Spencer double, um, as well as the filial confessions of Edmund Goss, and the focus on Adam, the biblical first father. Right? So he, it, it, my, what, the way I'm seeing Borges' writing is that he metaphorically transforms his own life um, into other things, you know, he surrounds his own life by other things that are from history, literature, myth, um, and philosophy. And so the, they all become kind of symbolic. And then his Borges' dueling personality traits may be narrated with the help of Stevenson's theme of the duality of human nature. This, Robert Louis Stevenson was one of Borges' favorite authors, and he refers to him often um, with great love, actually. Um, then Borges' solitude and invisible side may be represented by H.G. Wells's Invisible Man and Zeno's Lonely Labyrinth of Thought, you know, which is, for instance, at the end of La Muerte y la Brucola. Uh, Borges' childless love life, but fecund creativity, may be hinted at by the eternal solitary cycles of the phoenix, as described by Quevedo, Brown, Sir Thomas Brown, and Ross, Alexander Ross, the Scottish Calvinist um, who attacked um, Sir Thomas Brown because um, he dared to write about the human body and things like that. 
um, Borges's ambiguous feelings about his identity within familial and Argentine history may be expressed via the symbolic gaucho figure of Jose Hernandez and W.H. Hudson figures, yeah, um, with their dialectic of fate versus free will. Borges's multiple existences and many roles he played within one life may be expressed by means of an immortal protagonist inspired by Homer, who moves through many incarnations as real and imaginary beings, including Ulysses. Of course, I read Ulysses and I read um, Joyce, Eliot, Shakespeare, all these people at Newcastle as well. So, you know, so the genesis of my book goes back a long way. Uh, Borges uh, sometimes switched his loyalties, and this tendency may be hinted at in his stories about traitors, about fickleness in love, and about exiles, that's including his own uh, grandmother, English grandmother, including the biblical Adam, who is exiled from paradise. Uh, Borges suffered an important humiliation when he was a young man, and he often narrates the struggle to express his own identity. Primary, recurring primarily to Spinoza, Schopenhauer, and Shakespeare, whose coward Parolis discovers his internal strength and asserts his identity, echoing the words of God. So um, basically, um, within, within the things that I used to notice, the very cerebral side to Borges's literature, I now spy a strand that is personal and often intimate. And he also wrote about um, saying that quite often a plot, there could be two plots, the visible one and the invisible intimate one. And that's what I see in Borges's work. But the, the intimate one doesn't just relate to one story, it often weaves in and out a number of stories and poems. And reading the poems, in particular the late poems, can be the clue as to uh, what's happening in the stories, I think. And uh, for me, research, a lot of research is to do with detective work. And because I knew his can can canonical work so well, including the essays, um, Otras Inquisiciones, Discussion, all these things, so well, um, <clears throat> I, I often got a hunch that an illusion, for instance, was would be important in a particular way. And so I'd go and look at the original work uh, that he was alluding to. And there I would find something absolutely amazing, often just a little bit round the corner. Not He's never likes to make it too easy. And I, whenever I went and looked something up in the library, um, something a bit arcane often, I'd find something amazing that it was, you know, just, you know, he pointed me there, you know. And the thing, this detective work just kept going. I couldn't stop because I just kept finding more and more and more um, that I thought was fascinating. <clears throat> so I'm so grateful to Tamas's Boydell and Brewer for allowing me to get this work out into the world. Um, thank you, Stephen. Stephen, of course, is um, more or less in charge of Tamas's. Yeah, or, or as the general editor, actually, yeah, as, as yeah, okay. Megan Millen, actually, much okay. more. Well, yeah, but thank you so much. Thank you so much, Cynthia. That's very, very interesting in, in, indeed to give us a sense of the. Uh, uh, and I think yes, we can uh, we can put our, our claps on as well if we want. I'd like to clap that. Say so that was very interesting to hear about the genesis, and I also it led me to think about three questions because as the sort of uh, you know the coordinator, the idea is that there might be general questions. So I put them in the chat, and we can come back to those. Um, but they do relate to some of the themes that you mentioned. One of them, which is, do we read literary texts differently as we get older? Um, and, you know, that's an interesting uh, question in itself. And do we need to know the writer's biography in order to understand his or her work? I think the answer is going to be yes, I think, uh, certainly from yourself and certainly from me. But um, but uh, that, that's something to, to bring up as well, because, um, you know, when I was at, at Cambridge, I think I was taught... Um, not to read the biography um, and not to know about the film director and not to know about the literary because I had to focus on the text. Yeah. And it was such a relief to me, actually, to be honest, when I went to the University of London 
Um, and I was allowed to meet the writers and to go to talk to them, etc. So, um, so that's a, that's a question. And the other one was how the third one was how the visible and the invisible plots of Borges, Borges's work come together. Um, so we can come back to those questions, or we can drop them as you, as you as the audience wishes. But I'd now like to move on, if I may. Uh, thank you very much, Cynthia, for that. Um, to introduce to you. Uh, Professor um, Evelyn Fishburne, who was born in Vienna, but emigrated with her parents uh, to Argentina when she was a year old. When she left Buenos Aires to go to university in Geneva, her brother gave her the MSA edition of Borges's Obras Completas in six individual, and she remembers gray uh, paperbacks, well, she still has them, and she has never stopped reading them since. She is currently honorary professor at University College London, where she was for many years visiting professor and is professor emeritus of Latin American literary studies at London Metropolitan University. She has worked extensively on um, Borges and edited Borges and Europe Revisited in 1998 and a Borges dictionary in collaboration with C.K. Hughes in 1990, um, a revised and updated edition is now available online through the Borges Center. Her latest publication is Hidden Pleasures in Borges's Fiction, which was published at the University of Pittsburgh in 2015. And other in, uh, there are other in, uh, publications include The Betrayal of Immigration in 19th Century Argentine Literature. And more recently, she has published Borges and Buddhism in the Cambridge University Press Borges in Context series and, and an essay on Borges and Conrad, which is coming out very soon in a book on reception of Conrad in Europe. Her work, Hidden Pleasures, is being translated into Spanish and she's a seasoned reviewer and she won an award for her latest report for the Bulletin of Contemporary Hispanic Studies, uh, which was the Liverpool University Press uh, Awards for Outstanding Journal Reviews. She's also very much in demand um, in the uh, in the media, and in her last Zoom talk, um, she was uh, she she spoke uh, to the BBC World Service. I could uh, give my uh, thoughts on the book, um, and then once that's done, we could then pass on and, and uh, uh, get uh, Evie's thoughts. Would that be acceptable to the uh, the meeting? Okay, let let's do that. Right now. Um, uh, Cynthia, could you show the, the title of the book, please? Um, uh, this is this is a stage prop there. OK, you can all see that word enigma. Well, I think the book goes right to the heart of the problem of Borges because it focuses on uh, Jorge Luis Borges' enigma. If you were to think of one word that could synthesize this brilliant writer, there are some that could come close. There could be erudition. That was my first uh, reaction, uh, to, to be honest, when I first read his work. Fictionality, even the trickster, or quirkiness. But I think there's no word that sums him up as much as enigma. And this was brought home to me years ago when I was teaching at the University of Kentucky and I had a class of undergraduates in a class on Latin American short fiction. And I would have fic fictionis on the syllabus. And I asked them to read one short story. I would often ask them to do this and I would often choose Pierre Menard, author of the Quixote. And I could often tell which students had managed to read the story and which hadn't. Those who hadn't read the story uh, looked the same as normal. Uh, they looked reasonably happy with life. They were engaged in their normal conversations about basketball. Some of them were looking absentmindedly out of the window. And the ones who had look, read it looked confused bemused and sometimes a bit angry, as I discussed. <laughs> How could this writer be a genius, they would say. He writes a story about a French writer, Pierre Menard, who doesn't really exist anyway, who's creating a translation of one of the great masterpieces written in the Spanish language that Jay Allen has been telling us all about, Don Quixote, which we've started reading. But in doing so, he writes the same word text word for word. Bemusement is not strong enough a word for some of the reaction of the students to this. Some got it. Some got it. And found it ironic and clever. 
and wanted to talk about the ways in which literature or history or words age and change over time. But there was also a hardcore of students who refused to take it seriously. If this was genius, I could hear them say, uh, they wanted nothing of it. They'd stick with Juan Rulfo's El Llano en Llamas or a favorite Horacio Quiroga's short stories. I got many, many essays on Horacio Quiroga. In fact, I know his work very well now as a result of so many stories, so many essays rather. Um, or short stories by Julio Cortázar, Axolotl was one that they liked a lot. There was always, I concluded, something irreducibly enigmatic about Borges. When Ev Evie and I discussed the book, we decided we'd each look at different chapters, which I've mentioned at the beginning. Uh, we knew there'd be crossovers, but we thought it best to do justice to this fantastic book by looking at three chapters each. So my chosen chapters were the rule Borges, as I've mentioned, translation and Borges' creator. Now, of course, to have your first chapter in a book which focuses on Borges as enigma and to have a title such as The Real Bo Borges inevitably begs the question. For as the argument will run, if you know who the real Borges is, there's in effect no enigma about him, is there? So um, uh, there's a problem. But this either or disjunction, as we soon discover when we begin reading the book, is too Manichaean to be applicable. Cynthia moves gradually into an analysis of the great man's work, and she starts with a quotation from an interview in which Borges says that the stories were about myself, my personal experiences. Now, there are other things that she could have referred to, but she takes that particular sentence and that particular idea, and then, as it were, extends that idea um, and takes the implications of that statement to its furthest philosophical limit points. And she looks at crucial, often painful experiences in Borges' life. I mean, we often have to go over the sort of uh, the brothel experience, don't we? Um, that's one of the things that, you know, in, 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 when, when looking at the biography of Borges, um, and then looks at ways in which Borges transmuted those experiences um, into his stories. As she argues, Borges, like Shakespeare, knew how to transmute his life's events into fables. And the reference to Shakespeare is very apt, I think, um, for there's so many things about Shakespeare we do not know. We do not know when he went to London, whether he was a poacher or not, I think he wasn't, uh, whether he was pu punished by a local landowner in Warwickshire, I think he wasn't, and we do not know whether he was a Catholic or not, I believe he was. Um, but indeed, we often get caught when interpreting Shakespeare in a cycle or a spiral, which is often dazzling between the life and the work. But the fact that when discussing the connection between Borges's life and work, Cynthia refers to three biographies, those by Cohen, Edwin Williamson and Jason Wilson, I think makes it clear that the chapter is not written to reveal who the real Borges is, but rather to focus on how elusive he is and also how he rewrites his own life and rewrites his life via other lives. The chapter is also very helpful, I think, in drawing out the different emphasis on the three biographies. Cohen is better on metaphysics than he is on sex, and metaphysics rather, or than he is on sex. Williamson is obsessed with Borges's sex life and psychoanalyzes too much, perhaps. And Wilson is a witty rat raconteur with a good knowledge of Argentina. And this stood out for me. And as Cynthia says, she's not interested in psychoanalyzing Borges, but analyzing the process of transmutation of the trivial events of his life into literature, which is a different thing. I think it's very helpful to have those hard edges of the difference there. For its part, the, trans the chapter on translation seems at first as if it's taking a sideways journey but it builds its case. It shows how important and indeed seminal translation is for Borges, it looks at it from lots of different ways. It draws firstly on what can be seen as the most important study, or until now anyway, of translation in Borges's work by Efrain Cristal, um, who I should say, I'm gonna make a plug, I hope I can do this, will be giving a lecture in a conference I'm organizing at UCL on the 19th of July, and so please do come along to that. It's, co it's called Quo Vardis, the conference. It's in Eventbrite. I hope I'm allowed to do that. Jenny might take the plug out of my um, 
of my of my picture on the screen if I do this too much. So anyway, just one plug for that. 19th of July, quite soon. So she starts with Efrain Kristal's work and then moves into more practice based space, um, which I get the sense as well um, as a as a as a linguist and also as a a translator, as a professional translator, th this comes over very strongly here. Um, and I think this is great, this stuff here, because of course there's lots of different ways of reading Borges. You can be a philosopher, you can be in an English department, you can read lots of different ways, but I must admit, I prefer, you know, someone who's a linguist as well, you know, who can read the Spanish and who can read other languages and look at the way that they come together. And I think that there's, there's a value in there. And I think, um, so I'd commend uh, this, this this chapter uh, in particular as well. So it looks at those translations and compares them. Um, it's then followed by Borges' own interest in creative writers who were also translators themselves. This, of course, is an interesting one because it's as time has gone on, uh, translation has itself been seen as a type of creative activity, hasn't it? Uh, whereas in the old days, they were simply the uh, handmaidens of someone else's genius. Uh, translators nowadays are seen as, you know, real writers, as um, uh, Theo Hermans often used to point out to me when I'd forgotten that point at meetings uh, in, in, in who's, who's now retired, but uh, led the, uh, uh, the translation studies with Craig Panache uh, for many years at UCL. Um, so it looks, it's, it then looks at uh, Borges' own interest in Fitzgerald and Robert Graves and others. And then it ends with a rather intriguing example of translation of back translation. I don't know if any of you know what that is. Um, I did know a bit about it. And in fact, I've got a graduate student who's working on it. I find it quite bemusing, the whole idea of studying it. But still, it's when you translate something from one language to another language, then translate it back into the original language. And you often get something... Uh, rather different. You, you can, if you want, and you know, I have done this, didn't realise I was doing this, kind of torment students with this. You shouldn't do this kind of thing. Um, you, you can make them, uh, you, know, you know, sort of translate, uh, you do your own translation of a Spanish text and then get them to translate it uh, back into Spanish and then point out how incorrect it is because you, of course you're making them translate into the original. Um, uh, so it's a rather interesting example that she has there um, and also gives the evidences of the strange tricks, I think, that language plays before our eyes, especially with the, in the hands of a writer like Jorge Luis Borges. Finally, the chapter on the creator draws inspiration from a point made, made by Robin Fiddy. And I rather like the way that the book does this. It sort of starts off with the main theme um, and then it, takes uh, takes those ideas um, uh, and the, and the one I just wanted to quote this um, was from Robin Robin Fidian um, and I think it bears repeating really and can be we can discuss this obviously later on but he says the following the history of 19th century South America including Peru and Chile as well as Uruguay and Argentina provided Borges with raw materials for a uniquely personal narrative Borges's male forebears in particular, could be seen as embodying Creole virtues transmitted along the Suarez La Prida Borges axis, all the way down to its youngest scion, uh, Jorge Luis. And what follows after that um, is an entirely absorbing, mainly in terms of uh, the ways in which Borges would use the stories of his own forebears, mixes them up with um, uh, stories of literary writers, mixes them up with various shards of his own life, um, and then, as it were, I think what Cynthia was talking about before, makes those other stories uh, personal somehow. She talked as well about how, um, uh, as she, when she came back to Borges, what she saw as cerebral um, actually had an emotional impact uh, and ideas. Um, and I think that's a, a very interesting idea. So it certainly comes out in the last chapter. Um, in summation, this is a wide ranging and comprehensive book. Um, the, while it has a broad sweep, is also punctilious when it comes to the details. And I, Borges, you feel, I don't know if you'd agree with me, uh, Cynthia and others, uh, always wanted or required a reader who would notice the details. I think, uh, Cynthia, you mentioned about a, a word 
in a, in a sentence that you would then go off. The, the, the out of place word in a sentence, which indicates there's more afoot, and then you dig a bit deeper, and then you find some other things. Um, as as you mentioned as well, looking up things and finding something you didn't expect about the history of the Second World War or something. Um, uh, the, 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 odd, the odd reference which seems awry and you know that Borges kind of got this wrong he wasn't that stupid um, and, and then you realise there's actually another history which is written beneath that I learnt a great deal from this book and I think you will too so I commend this book to you I think it's a great, uh, great book and um, great fun I'll just start to show that where I connected was when Stephen talked about Pierre Menard and about the students saying this is a silly story. I had a sort of fairly similar incident in that I was talking about it and gave a handout with the famous quotation and a rather elderly uh, gentleman patronizingly came up to me and said, there's a mistake in your handout. Uh, meaning, you know, that the handout was mistaken because I was repeating the same thing there. So that that's sort of the, the things about Pierre Benin, but I hope to have to say a lot more about that later. Um, okay, I'll, uh, I'll start as if I had nothing had happened by thanking Cynthia, and I mean this very, very warmly. I'm uh, uh, thanking Cynthia for inviting me and to say how much I have enjoyed her book. It really was a, a pleasure of, just because of the elegance of her writing, but also the discovery of so many points. I have spent decades, as I think I heard on the phone Stephen mentioning, reading my little gray paperback uh, editions of it, but I didn't think there'd be anything new, which uh, no, I knew there'd always be something new about Borges, but that there'd be so much that I'd have to rethink so radically all that I've done. But I shall, I shall enjoy that. And thank you, thing, uh, Cynthia. What this book has done for me is uh, it's offered me a chance to revisit and reacquaint myself with, in my case, Borges's writings. Uh, which I've, uh, I think I've said this, sorry, that's the trouble of having notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I suggest that when you read this book, you will equally be challenged to revisit and rethink what you thought about Borges. It won't eradicate what you thought, but it'll add to it. Uh, Cynthia's got an amazing malleability in her readings. She establishes original links through imaginative and erudite associations. Um, I think I had just heard uh, Stephen say something about the detail and how she sort of brings in the detail and makes that detail turn round. And yes, of course, that's what she does in her reading of Borges. Uh, it's a reading that I love because I, uh, I, I think that Borges was a miniaturist and mine is a miniaturist reading of Borges. So I love the details and starting from the detail, going from the detail to the whole. Um, her erudition is just impressive. I think she must be uh, uh, the countries, the world, I don't know, the expert on Thomas Brown and Borges, Sir Thomas Brown, and perhaps just Sir Thomas Brown in itself. And I'm hoping that perhaps she will be able to synthesize her erudition. No, don't shake your head, Cynthia, it's true. No, uh, just uh, there's many experts on Sir Thomas Brown that know a lot more than me. Um, I, I know not, quite a lot about Not this Borges. combination of Sir Thomas Brown and Borges. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm also thankful, and I think all her, your readers will be, the way you recapitulate at the end of each chapter sort of, because I think you've got to tell people what you've told them. And you do that so very well. You foreground your ideas so very well. Um, authority. Okay, now we've... Sorry, that's a trouble. When you make notes, you can never read them again. Uh, uh, I think the sort of core of your thesis, as it were, and I hate to use that word, but the purpose of what you're saying is to say that Borges, if you read Borges, that he transformed the personal into strange symbols and that his fictions are symbols for the personal. You make the link between the autobiographical and the work itself. It's a link that 
I will now have to make. I've never, I realized that I've never made it because, dare I confess this, I never liked Borges very, well, I, I admired him and I revered him and all worshiped his work on him. But I always, let me put it this way, I always felt that the man was not a la altura de la obra, was not, um, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I just didn't see the man in La Obra. So I'm looking forward to, look, to, to, to searching for that and to rethinking of that in, in mind. Um, because, yeah, you say he transmutes life events into books. And I'll have to, I'll, you know, I think we can all look and work on that transmutation if we need it. I think... Stephen already mentioned the three translations, uh, but I also want to say that apart from all that he says, and I, I agree with, with everything in his assessments of each and whatever, uh, certainly, and uh, Jason's just a joy, um, I, I think I admire Edwards is incomparable on background, and we don't have to go with him on every detail of interpretation. But the one that I was so happy to see was J.M. Cohen. And you refer to him a lot. And I actually, if you see my picture, you'll know that I'm old enough to have been at the conference that he gave, I think in Canning House on Borges. And of course, he was the contemporary biographer of Borges. He was there when it all happened. And I think that gives it a particular, almost a unique flavor if you look at all the uh, uh, biographers that you mentioned, of, of course, uh, Esther Bachis as well, but she's not in English. Uh, so anyhow, uh, Jane Co has a unique contribution. Um, Emma Sons, like J.M. Co, uh, you say that J.M. Uh, Cohen, because he was a contemporary at the time, there wasn't the critical apparatus, he did not see the connection between Emma Sons and Borges. And I must confess, nor had I until I read your book. Um, I can now see where the connection is. And I think sort of that's a very, very interesting connection because I think it it shows the way in which this transmutation of life event into books operates. And that is, I think, and I'm, uh, uh, yeah, I'm doing doubles, so the, I, I'm anticipating myself on doubles. But, you know, doubles are normally exact replicas, sort of, yeah, just that, exact replicas. But it doesn't have to be like that. And I think what works in Emma Sons and, and the, uh, and, and the sexual in it, initiation is that they both have that as a central event in the story. But in my reading of Emma Sons, what is remarkable about that story is that that central shattering event links, there's two, two doubles, two, two plots that replicate each other, each other, plot one before she has the, the intercourse with a man and plot two after she's had it and that revelation that that must have been what her father did to her mother. And the whole motivation changes. So really the plot becomes completely its opposite. But if you read it, nothing changes in the execution of it. And I think that sort of is, is a symmetry that is based on a radical difference that doesn't appear at surface level. Um, now I'm gonna look at that in the light of, the, the, that you suggest, more from the light of, uh, no, but I, I, I don't think I'll, 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 I'll end with that because I will say it can be a life event transmuted into the story, but it's still for me the 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 fable, what he's done with it, that is my my most important reading. Um, what else did I want to say? Um, I was going to ask you, in, uh, maybe in the course of the conversation, whether you could summarize all that you have to say about La Rosa de Paracelsus, because that's such a difficult story and intricate story, and you seem to have worked on it so through it and is in it. And I think if you could just 
sort of standing on the top of uh, the proverbial top of a pin, uh, talk us through that story and your findings and your views on your stories. Um, I also wanted to say um, you have a connection between, yeah, why do you think that he chose the epigraph uh, in Ulrika, the, false, the, the epigraph from the false of the saga in, a, in Ulrika, that he has in Ulrika for his, sorry, own epitaph, I mean for his, yeah, the epitaph on his tomb. Do you have any views on that? Maybe when you reply, you could give us something. Um, what On symmetries, I know that you're very much on the other side of the death of the author debate. And I think by the end of this, reading your book, you may have carried a lot of readers with you. You're carrying me. Uh, um, the idea that he wants you will want to insert Borges into the into his readings is very very appealing. It's very interesting. It's it's quite novel actually to have such an autobiographical reading of him. Um, there's the you talk about the symmetry between Historia del Guerrero y la Cautiva and the Drotkuft. And that's sort of, a, it's a lovely parallel, a lovely symmetry. Um, in La Morte y la Brújula, you talk about the symmetry between Lernrod and Scharlach. And I think that's a symmetry that sort of we can easily see, the red Scharlach and Lernrod and whatever much has been written there. But I was interested in uh, your talk about the threes and the fours. And how the th and um, the interplay of the threes and the four, and the interplay between the triangle and the lozenge, and the lozenge links it, of course, to Emma Sons, where she sees lozenges when she thinks of her her home. Um, I, I, my interpretation of the three and the four is is you talk about the, the uh, link the whole thing is that on based on the tetragrammaton and there the tetragrammaton is four letters uh, as implied in the name but three letters because one's a repetition so it's three different letters so that is an interplay in the story that can do with symmetries and doubles and not symmetries and not doubles i don't know what you feel about that uh, a detail. I'm, I'm jumping. When you talk about Greater Stern, I thought I knew everything about the uh, Jews who lived in Argentina, who had escaped Nazis and whatever, but I had never heard of this photographer. It's a joy. Just these, these are one of the many joys that you get in Cynthia's book is that you go from a, it, it takes you, it deviates onto uh, in, into a lovely area. Um, so uh, I think that's a lovely deviation and one of many that you'll find in her book. Um, you mentioned the link, I can, you can see that I'm jumping, but you know, otherwise it would be even more boring. You can see the link between the coin, coin, coin in the Zahir and the Keniga. I mean, I don't, I had never saw it until you showed it, but now I can see, and the interesting, the sort of the Zahir as a coin, and the gold, which is what, what, what money is meant to do. And you link that on your lovely interpretation of Sahir from the word Sa'edid. I'd never thought of that. It's this sort of going into the details that is interesting. Um, when you talk about personal elements in Ruinas, and that's sort of the father and the son and the phoenix and eternally and the ashes and all that. Your, your argument there is really very, very, very interesting indeed. And I'm very grateful for you to for showing those connections between Ruinas and other stories. Um, the link to, uh, Stevens mentioned Shakespeare and uh, everything and nothing. And you, to, you can link, you're linking at some stage also, not just all the things that you, but 
Rina's Everything and Nothing in Las Ruinas Circulares, where he is the ash, he's nothing, and then he's everything, and then nothing again. Um, so that's sort of, uh, th that's a very original way of reading Rina Circulares in autobiographical terms and in terms of another story. What else? Yeah. When you talk about Vincent Moon, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'm sure that, that I'm missing something because you sort of say that the, uh, the hero becomes the traitor, but they both have the same scar. Do you mean that sort of super metaphorically, the hero becomes the traitor? Would you like me to answer or? Yeah, or, yeah. yeah. Well, um, um, I, I was re-reading it yesterday because I thought maybe I've got it wrong because we had a phone call where you mentioned that. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. In, in the story that he tells uh, where he's in Ireland, um, he's saying I, he's using the first person, and he's a freedom fighter. Um, and um, it, then the one who is called Moon within the story, within the story, um, he's, get, he, he, he's getting attacked. And the ones called I, the, is the freedom fighter called I, um, saves him. Uh, so at that point within the story, he's the hero. I, maybe he's not a real hero, but he's the hero the extent of saving him and then at the end that one gets killed and actually so the one who was pretending to be tell, uh, the I the first person he gets killed by Moon and then Moon confesses that he's who he is so I mean maybe I think there's different ways of describing what's going on you, yeah, you refer so to yeah. The unreliable narrator, which is another exactly. way. That's, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's correct as well. But yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I think I was also focusing on the name Moon. Exactly, it's the round reflection. Yeah. You see, so I mean, it may be that that what I say is not always a hundred percent. You know, I mean, can you prove? You know, how can you prove? Like, you know, when there's things keep with Borges, things keep moving into other things. Well, I just think that, you know, we say it's eternally open and I think it's eternally open to your type of interpretation, because as I remember the story, I should have re read it, or, but I, I, I agree with the moon and whatever. He mm. pretended to be the other person mm. so that he should be heard out. Mm. And then I but linked he, it in with the sort of hidden side of a, per, a split personality, like with Jekyll and Hyde, I think. So the double, the Stevenson double. Yeah, I, I think I linked it, it in like with that. that. I just, uh, I, I just thought that that would. Do you remember this uh, uh, a book called The Reader? Somebody called Schlick, and mm -hmm. she was a Nazi, something or other, and she just she presented herself as the victim so that she should be read out. Another, yeah. Anyhow, no. Yeah, a lot I, of his a lot of his characters are portrayed as being enlightened, and then they're portrayed as being um, traitors. Um, you know, because yeah. it depends to group loyalty often yeah, depends yeah, which group yeah, you belong yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and in um, um, Historia de the Traidori de la Irue. Yeah, let's see. I, um, the, in that one, that's very much the case. Um, you know, that people are switching from one culture, one world to another, and one minute they're they they're enlightened and then the then the the villains you know and it's well he is the traitor but the cause needs him to be the hero so mm -hmm. they make him into the hero so it just sort of shows how personas can be put onto personas or whatever mm -hmm. but i thought it was very interesting when you then said you linked that to borges and that he was also traidori héroe because he had been considered a cipajo and whatever yeah. but yeah of course i mean that was well after the story was written. So it just shows that the stories live on and bring new meanings and acquire new meanings. And that was very, very interesting. You asked about yeah. the Rose of Paracelsus, because that's very much that as well. Well, he's there, he's a trickster. Paracelsus yeah. is a trickster or he's a magician. And firstly, he's working with the alchemical um with uh, alchemy and and he's got but now he's old his forge is is not is 
is no longer working and all this. So he's using the divine word now. Yeah. Um, so he's, you know, like the Kabbalists. Um, and it all links in with paradise, with the Genesis. A lot of the time, Borges writes about the books of Genesis, as you know. And um, but the traitor hero thing, I think, links in there because he was he was really seriously called a traitor in Argentina because he, he was used by the very horrible, ghastly, um, horrendous um, people running Argentina. They used his image um, to try and prop up their, their own image. And yeah. Um, yeah. it was well, terrible. He was a little that's, bit that's, complicit in that and then apologised. Yeah, he, he, well, he let, was... Let's not get you know, exactly. down into that one. But, yeah. but other people called him master, so, you know... That's the, right, yeah. But, no, I thought it was a very, very lovely... It's a lovely, lovely connection. That's what I say. You make the story sort of live on and come into politics of today. But, I mean, he'd been interested in that theme for decades. So yeah. it wasn't yeah. like a new theme. But I think it finds its fullest expression in that lovely, late... Very very late story about Paracelsus, <coughs> yeah. which is beautifully translated by Di Giovanni, who was his, uh, you know, collaborator for years. He's a beautiful translator, and he, is a beautiful he calls it Paracelsus and the Rose. As a great friend, I think they fell out big time. Oh, did, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and they fell out yeah. big time, and he wouldn't have anything to do with him. But you know, that doesn't. Mean that he but Borges fell out with a lot of his friends, and I think fickleness is a, is a theme that comes in when we're talking about his personal things coming into the stories. Like, yeah. for instance, in El Thayer, after Teodalina, who he's in love with, after she dies, um, then he goes to her wake, and then he comes out and he goes to a bar, and in the change for a coin, mm. um, he gets the Thayer, and it's all about change, change, change. Yeah. And, you know, and I think he's dramatizing his own fickleness. It's about moving on after being in love. Uh, so, but he was, he, he cut off from a lot of his friends um, at different times, you know. Um, it's interesting. Yes. yes, yes. Well, there's a whole controversy about that, which we don't need to sort of visit now. Um, now, whatever. Um, yeah. Can I come back briefly to, uh, I said I would, to Pierre Bernard? And you sort of say that it's a story that can be read as a serious and it can be read as a spoof because of the way in which he treats the Countess of Bagnoreggio. Well, I, I just he, I just referred to her, I think. Or That's he right, but you know her. that he should have, and she wrote for the magazine Lux, and that oh, sort yeah. of is an ink to treat her, to treat the sort of with a little bit as a joke, as a parody, as a whatever. But actually, uh, you're quite right, and yet when you talk about the detail, there's a detail in that story where somebody else who is ridiculed even more than the Countess of Bagnoreggio, and that is Madame Henri de Bachelier, sort of one of the things was to, to read her novel as if it had been written by her and not ghosted. And he sort of always has uh, things about uh, uh, her and puts her in the only footnote. And in that footnote, he sort of says how sad that she made this mistake. And of course, if you read the note footnote very carefully, she is the only one who understood what Pierre Bernard's work was about. And that when she reads the one, the other one is inscribed in that book. So it is that the Quevedo is in the Cervantes or whatever the details is. So it's just very, very interesting how <laughs> one detail doesn't, or one reading coexists with another and doesn't I, I think I missed the subtle, I, think I, missed, I think I missed the subtleties of that but um most I people that, did I think I would I, I, <laughs> most people did but uh there is I think Olasso who didn't and I didn't and I, I think no, now, Rex Butler who's a critic who I very much like <laughs> whose book about Borges's fictions was a bestseller certainly on Kindle um he said that that story had had the most enormous impact not just within literary studies, but also within history, within philosophy of art. And uh, it, it had an absolutely huge impact, apparently. Stephen, do you want to come in on that? 
Yeah. Yes, I mean, it, it obviously also had an enormous impact um, on my students at the University of Kentucky as well. Um, no, I think that's right. I think that, and this is the interesting thing about Borges, and that comes over, doesn't it? The way in which you can be talking to someone in the history of art or even about their work, and then Borges pops up in it. And you think, well, wait a minute, you know, you're, you're, you're from the, you know, from uh, Czech Republic. How, how did Borges get in there? So, I mean, I think that the, um, that, that, that's, that, that's interesting. The, the, the really intriguing thing, I think, is that the inexhaustible nature of some of Borges's work, um, mm. in the sense that you can go back to it, and just as, as uh, Evi has mentioned there, there's going to be those details. And that's what I used to find sometimes. I, I wouldn't like to say that I threw Borges's book around the room at any point, because, of course, they're far too valuable to do that with. <laughs> um, <laughs> But um, I, I, what, what used to find I used to do, did find frustrating was the fact, exactly as Evie has mentioned there, that you you are looking for, and you've called it the invisible and the visible. You're looking for the invisible because it, it, in a sense, means that you have to, especially in that story. There's there's no there's no visible story in a sense. It it, it it's almost nonsense. Um, uh, oh, 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 well, I think it is nonsense, actually. So, so then you have to go for that other level. But when, when you're looking for that, you then get points at which you're going in a certain direction, and then you get something else that, that seems to be actually pulling in a different direction. So you thought, you might have thought to yourself before you, uh, you know, rather naively, what before you started reading Borges, that once you got onto the uh, invisible plot, as it were, the plot beneath it, that everything would then fall into place. Um, but in fact, it doesn't do that as your book shows. Um, uh, and I, but I think that's a very interesting point that uh, Evie's mentioned. I just wanted to say one other thing as well is that Evie's also mentioned about Emma Suntz. And um, it's funny that when we, the two of us had a chat about this before, about what, what we might want to say and how we split things up. We both came up with the fact that, in, this is independently, that we were both surprised by your interpretation of Emma Suns because we, uh, neither of us had, had sort of seen Borges in that story in quite that way. Um, and I thought it was a good, in thinking about it in the discussion as well, I thought it, it's a good example of the type of ways in which you are using not as it were, that story and cutting it off from things, but bringing in the biography and other stories as well that then lead to a new interpretation of it, which um, at first, you know, at first reading is quite surprising. I mean, I don't know if you feel that, 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 you, that, that, it, that it was a surprising reading, but I'm sure you didn't because you feel that, um, you know, it kind of fits in with the other readings that you're given of other stories. Um, but anyway, we can we can come back to that. I don't know what, what, whether you whether you'd like to comment on that uh, at that point there, Cynthia. That, yeah. that, um, yeah, that that's yeah. that's that's a surprising reading. I, or, or has anyone ever said to you that that you've you know? Um, well, I don't it, think so because I've probably not um, had the chance to um, tell anyone. But I, for me, I've just read it that way for quite a while, and yeah. um, it's obviously it's not something I can prove. And so I quite often in the book talk about things being metaphorical and uh, metaphorically Borges in disguise. We're talking about the young virgin who um, in, called Emma Zunz, who um, seeks um, a man, um, a stranger to have sex with um, <clears throat> because she wants to avenge um, a wrong done to her father. And um, she, she needs it to sound genuine when she accuses her boss of rape. Um, uh, but at the moment of having sex with the stranger, um, she um, has this horrific realization that this, is, that this awful thing was done by her father to her mother. And so then she um, um, wants to uh, uh, avenge this awful thing that's been done to her. And so it brings in the thing of the father, the mother, the, the, the virgin aged 19 having sex with a prostitute. So there's four people there in the story. And one of the traumatic events in Borges's life that has now been well documented by excellent biographers, and I've not done any of this 
important work I've just drawn on their conclusions. They um, believe that Borges, the young man aged about 19 in Geneva, had a traumatic event in a brothel and that his father played a role. Um, and it's possible that his, it's possible, we don't know, that his father had had sex with the same woman. So the threes and the fours are coming in there, the th four if you include the mother. So, you know, but there's the sort of these themes that go through in these invisible plots, they go, they go all over the place. Um, and often this do four or do four uh, mm. pops up. And this was the, this, this pretty triangular square, um, Dubourg, I think it was called. Uh, but it pops up in, in the story, El Otro, the other, where the, the old Borges meets the young Borges by this double river, which is both the River Charles in Cambridge, um, yeah. Massachusetts, and the Rhone in Geneva. And they discuss, you know, what books were in, in their home in Geneva. Do you remember the du, Dubourg or Dufour? The names keep changing a wee bit. And the older one says, oh, I can see that you're getting over it now because you're getting the rhetorical, more the rhetorical habit or whatever. You know, so the, the, these these themes they weave through the stories and through the poems. That's that's what my book is really about: is is sort of trying to show this invisible plot. This it's like the thread of a Persian carpet that he refers to also the hidden things in the story, Kosas things, the hidden things under the carpet, you know, or inside the book that has never been opened, you know. Right. Yeah. That, that's very helpful. No, that, that that's very good. So I mean, that's that. So the uh, I, I think Evie's got a few more uh, comments yeah. with regard. To, I, I just, I, I to just wanted to say a few more to to to, to fulfil my my uh, allocation, and that was on illusion, if I may, and it's something that sort of really joins us too, Cynthia, because we both worked so much on on illusions, um, and uh, just a few little things I, I'm trying not to repeat what has been said you talked about Rosato and Alvarez and the um and and and, and the sort of with, yeah, yeah with Sir Thomas Brown or whatever so I'll bring a personal thing in there I was in Buenos Aires about two years ago and they very kindly invited me to the Biblioteca Nacional so I was there in the Biblioteca Nacional it was an amazing atmosphere and they are the most learned people that you can possibly ever meet. And their knowledge of Borges and of anything that's in and out is just amazing. So it's really, it was a, it, it's a joy. And I'm so glad that you mentioned them because they've really done an enormously important service to this. Uh, in the, in, uh, on allusions, there's an allusion to Carlyle. Uh, Go to, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, you look at uh, Carlyle in the relationship with the, with the Phoenix and the resurrection in La Secta del Phoenix or whatever. For me, the most important allusion to Carlyle is one that is, I can't understand why, but missed. And that is in, a, we, we were talking about betrayal as a theme in Borges. In the, the story El Indigno and the El, El Indigno, one just assumes that because he's Jewish, he is a traitor. And most readers have gone that sort of um, subliminal sort of more or less reading. And it's got something about Judas Iscariota. There are lots of things which allow you for that sort of interpretation. And at surface level, yes, he does. He does snitch on the fellow who had befriended him and who had made him his protege it's, and he does snitch on him and that fellow does get killed. But that's not a Borges story. A Borges story would see the, 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 the sort of a, a, a different sort of motivation and the motivation that I see is given by a sentence that he quotes Carlyle, there's an allusion to Carlyle and he, where he says, Carlyle has written that men need heroes. And nothing else is said about that. 
I, I wrote about El Indigno, I think later on in the book. Um, um, yeah, and but you, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you went with... Um, the name uh, is... Alan, not Alan Bowes, but uh, the other... Piglia, uh, with Piglia. Yeah, uh, Arles, the yeah, connection yeah, yeah. Arles. And I'm not sort of, dis you know, I'm not, uh, I'm doing Piglia's work. I'm just sort of saying that another reading, and I yeah. think that that, that mm. is a reading that you may judge accords with Borges, yeah. is to see that men need heroes. Yeah, I, I was also I connecting it in also with the Kabbalah, uh, because I don't think people have really noticed that link about the, the yeah, you go down. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, also I know. all the, the names of all these people who had Christian names and Jewish names. And the, the character himself, Santiago Feinstein, he changed his no, name. Fishbein. Oh, sorry, fish. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Um he changed the uh, my, my changed husband said he's very famous of uh, very proud of that because his name was Fishbein before oh. it was changed to Fishbein. So it's a very famous story. Yeah, but I'm, you know, I'm not disputing that all that happened. Well, sure there is. I, I, haven't, I haven't got all, there's so many meanings yeah. in Borges's stories that, yeah. I mean, I'm just getting a few, hopefully. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm just suggesting wrong. that he, that he killed him, caused him to be killed. To make him a hero. He yeah. on him to make him into yeah. a hero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because he sort yeah. of felt that the country mm -hmm. needed heroes. It mm -hmm. was being overrun by immigrants and yeah. the criollo ethics was going mm -hmm. out of the yeah. window, was being thrown out. So we have the paradox of a Jewish immigrant to Argentina who yeah. becomes the champion of El Compadrasco, and uh, that he did that as a sort of sacrifice for himself because he knew that he would be excoriated for having done that. Mm -hmm. So he, as in Judas, the three versions of uh, Judas, he debases himself mm -hmm. in order for the mm -hmm. cause. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a connection between that story and Las Tres Versiones de Judas. Well, I think there's a connection between so many of the stories. That's, that's right. one of the yeah. things that's so interesting. Yeah. That yeah. If you read them on their own, they're one yeah. thing. Yeah. But often yeah. you need to look what story is next to them in the collect that's collection right. yeah. and so on, because yeah. it often yeah. um, it puts quite a, a different yeah. angle on what yeah. you're, what you're reading. You also mention Andrea. And I think he, that's one of the, I mean, De Quincey yeah. is always, always, one should go to De Quincey and see there's a huge clue here. Because Andrea did exactly what the story is about. He mm -hmm. pretended something was there and then it became there. So Andrea was the first composer of a Hrön. Of a what? Of a Hrön, if I'm pronouncing Oh, yes, it, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So we're in and that is, part, yeah. That, that is willed part. into existence, becomes yeah. existence, and then invades our existence. Well, so the I think Prince that's is mentioned in Cloney as well, of course. Yeah. Uh, and Andrea also. That's yeah. the Rosicrucianism and all that as well. Yeah. Yeah. There's all this hermetic side to Borges, the 17th century hermeticism. Is, is another layer that's there, and that's the occult, you see. Yeah, this, yeah. This book well, you that link that very usefully, and uh, when, you, when you talk about everything and nothing, and the, the Kabbalah is one of the things of, you can say, uh, everything and nothing, because in the Kabbalah, the text itself is nothing. Yeah. What means the everything is the commentary of the text. So that's mm -hmm. one way of looking, the everything and nothing, the text, you, you link it to the Kabbalah. So the, the Kabbalah cryptic, is hermen the hermeneutic, that. cryptic way of that's reading. That's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Well, the actual central mm -hmm. bit has no meaning until the meaning is given to it by its commentators. Mm -hmm. Well, this one in the El Indigno, at the very beginning, he refers to this book called The Kabbalah Unveiled. That's Well, that's a translation. Rosa um, Rose. uh, Kabbalah yeah. de Kabbalah de Duzata. Yeah. yeah, that one. And yeah. um, I got it. I got a hold of it. I think of AB. I love this AB books because you can get all the yeah, second hand yeah, books. Yeah. Rosen. Well drop. done. Yes, yes, and yes. So I got a hold of a copy and it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anything has been written about that. But if I had another two lives to spend on this research, I would go into it. So well, you, get the young ones involved, you know, it's great. It's loads of stuff to uncover. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't need two lives. You're doing very, very well and filling this one with a lot of things. Yeah, but yeah, if you can, you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Um, I don't know why I said, but but precisely does not include. Yeah, yeah. When you talk, I, I think I'm stepping into Stephen's uh, territory here about translation. But I love the way you were sensitive about the the words were okay, but they didn't hear Eliot's voice, T. S. Eliot's voice. I love that comment. About oh, sorry, me or Steve? Yeah, me. Okay. Sorry, I thought. Yeah. Are you talking to yeah. me or to Stephen? Yeah. Okay. She does. He does. Does not ignore the cadence of the original. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Actually, that uh, that's great to know that we have a talk on translation because they, the, the, that whole thing about the original doesn't have to be faithful to the translation, but that that takes us away from your book. You, uh, I, I love the thing that you quote, uh, someone, and he says, you are Borges, aren't you? And he said, Abesis, something. This is when he visited St. Andrews, apparently. It, this yeah. is, um, yeah. Alistair Reed uh, wrote about this, I think. Mm. Alistair Reed, the great poet and yeah. wonderful translator of Neruda. Absolutely and Borges. wonderful translator. For me, yeah. he's the best translator, although perhaps not the most, some people think he's not so formally correct, but I prefer his poetry, well, his poetry translation. But Borges and Maria Kodama went there to stay when when um, Alistair Reed was living on the That's outskirts right, yes, of yes, St. Andrews. Yes. So I write about that as well. I can see yeah. one of my friends who lives in St. Andrews who's in the audience nodding. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see. Well, I wonder whether a friend who's nodding. Have you, uh, I, I, it's sensational, it's an awful, so I'll only do two seconds. But do you know a book by somebody called Jay Parini? Yeah, yeah. Well, Parini, he's, I've met him in, in, at Stanza, but the person in the audience um, who I'm talking about could tell us about. Would you like to come in, anyone or not? <laughs> yeah, he's, he's doing the one about being in a pub, in uh, uh, going around the Scottish pubs. With, That's right. Like, and he's had a lot. I mean, I think the Goodreads uh, praised him. He's had a lot of stuff. To, I think I'm the only one, I but I am it's coming out. I'm thing. disgusted from Cambridge. It's coming out, but it's I not think it's yet. a horrible, horrible um, abuse of uh, personal and uh, just, you know, all that thing about the incontinence and whatever. Yeah, you know. Well, I, I, is the book actually out? Is the book out to read? Is, it, is the book available? Somebody lent it to me. Oh, I thought say, I didn't oh, realize it was out book, yet. But, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, somebody, you know, she's a Scottish friend of mine and she just saw the lovely descriptions of the high line, high, uh, Highlands, and I just saw the denigrating, abusive way in which Watkins was treated. But anyhow, it's not about that book at all, at all. Yeah, no, Alistair Reed is a great, great translator of Watkins. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, 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 yeah. Um, I said that uh, uh, in the, the South on doubles, I don't know, uh, you, you pointed out sort of about the treatment of the doubles there and how it's already at the beginning. And it's true, the double lineage of Dalman is the librarian and, and the warrior the ancestors. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and it's so a that's personal where involvement brings because Borges himself family. had a double lineage. Sorry? Borges yeah. himself had a double lineage. Yes, and exactly. Borges himself didn't know whether he wanted to be, whether he wanted to die this way or that way, the hero would be in battle or, yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's a very lovely way of, of connecting. But um, I, I, I'll just wind up by saying thank you, Cynthia, for having opened up for his work, which one thought was already an oversaturated field and showing us that it isn't, that there's a lot still for us to, to read in it and to do about it and to enjoy about it. Oh, thank you so much, Evie. Thank you so much. It means well, I'm awesome. so glad that I was able to sort of come in and participate. I can't tell you the frustration. Well, um, it means I'm very grateful to you as such an expert um, to have agreed to not um, at all. It was, appear it was, today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only person I need to be grateful other than to you is to Jenny Stubbs, and I want to thank her now again for mm -hmm. having calmed me through, seen me through, and... Uh, with this successful ending for me and thank you, Jenny. yeah thank you very much indeed thanks thanks for inviting me great uh, okay thanks so much for that uh, Evie. yes and um, can we say that again to uh that's right to jenny that 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 was really very very good of you thank you so much jenny for doing that um you did save the day in that way because it's and it's so it's so important for us to 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 be able to 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 hear uh 
lots of new ideas and interpretations given by Evie as much as by uh, Cynthia um, about Cynthia's book as well. Um, so let, let's, um, I think we, we um, uh, what we wanted to do was to open things up a little bit uh, with regard to that. I think we've got a, a couple of uh, thoughts that, that came up before and I've mentioned them. Um, it, it depends whether we want to talk about them at all, whether we're reading texts differently uh, as we get older. Do we need to know biography? Um, that, this is a, a, a question I think that the answer is yes. I'm, I'm assuming, Cynthia, we will know that. How do the visible and invisible come together? We've we've talked quite a bit about that. So, um, but we do have one uh, question here from Veronica, which is that could we, you know, it, uh, discuss the connection between Roberto Bolaño uh, in relation to uh, Borges? But I don't know if if uh, Veronica would like to just say some things about that, um, because you do talk. Um, uh, and it, it, it could it, it might be a good idea if you, you talk a bit more about that because you say um, in relation to Borges, although being so different in genre and style, um, although that there's a, a, a connection between them. I don't know if Veronica is still on the line and whether she'd like to um, uh, to, to to voice that comment. Is Veronica here at all? I am here. Yes. My image okay. Is there. I have no image, but doesn't matter. Can you hear me? Yes, he can hear you. Yeah, that's absolutely fine, Veronica. If you could just say yeah. a bit more about that and the different in in uh, in genre and style, but the the interesting position you say of Roberto Bolaño. Yes, it's because I find Borges for me as as the book says an enigma, and a very interesting enigma where you can hide, you can have a lot of derivations, a lot of new ideas about him, and it's a never ending. But Roberto Bolaño, whom I admire very much, also is a very controversial figure, because you may know he he started this movement of infrarealism and all that having to do with the, with poetry and how the poets, the young poets, are doomed to die because there is not much interest in po in their poetry. But he said he suggests that he is a disciple of Borges, and that's something that. I still cannot connect. I still cannot see how he sees himself as a disciple of Borges. Well, I actually do write a little bit, maybe a couple of pages about Bolaño in my book. Um, I haven't read a lot of Bolaño, but I, I came across probably by accident a book called In Parentheses, which is a translation. And I really found it, I loved it. I thought it was very interesting. And um, it's full of short pieces. And um, one of them is about the, the Paracelsus story, Paracelsus and the Rose. And I use it as a sort of introductory, um, um, you know, a little introduction to that story that then weaves as a sort of theme throughout my book, one of the strands. But in each part of the book, I'm dealing with different bits. So at the end, we get on to, you know, the Kabbalah and the Genesis connection and paradise. It's all about original sin and all that stuff. But so I use that bit of Bolaño and also his visit to the graveyard mm -hmm. um, in Geneva. He writes about Borges and the ravens and that he couldn't believe that all it's like being in some story by Poe. And Poe was a great also um, influence on particularly La Muerte y la Bruja, and the philosophy of composition. Borges was very interested in that piece, and he wrote different things about it different times in his life. So I dip in um, to uh, Bolaño, but I don't know much about the wider Bolaño. Um, I'm not sure if I've answered it. Stephen might like to. Um. Well, I, I think that um, it, I, I suppose that the, the relationship normally is, is seen in terms of the rather erudite references to poetry, uh, uh, etc., and the, the allusions. And, and I think mainly uh, the use of the detective story mm -hmm. motif uh, within his stories. There's a lot, I think there are quite a few other uh, ways in which one could talk about that. But my, my sense was that. Uh, very much a kind of a literary writer um, who is always referring back to literature and living through literature. I, I, I sense that there is quite a bit of that in, in Bolaño, and he's mentioned that as well. 
Um, but I, I, I do I agree that there's there's a big difference between a writer who uh, you know specialises in short stories and short reviews, etc., um, and rather witty, uh, succinct works compared to 2066, for example. You know, a, 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 an absolutely massive novel. So it might be in terms of genre that there's not such a similarity, but I think in in some other ways there is. I don't know if anyone in the audience would like. We now I think are in open mic time. So if anyone would like to put up their hand or put something in the, uh, in, in, the uh, uh, in the chat, that would be absolutely fine. Or if anyone would like to make a comment at this point or ask, an, or ask another question. I've got a question there, Steve, uh, in yes, the chat. Please. please. Uh, oh, all right. Hi, Cynthia. Hi, Evan. Hi, yeah. Hi. Um, this is just a point of information. I'd be really interested to know if Borges makes any allusion to having read the what what are known in, in Argentina as the Viajeros Ingleses, all those books that came out in the 1820s by Francis Bonted and Basil Hall and Robert Proctor, uh, the, the very first travels through Argentina before it became Argentina. So, you know, the writing in the 1820s. I've just wondered if, you know, with his grandmother being English and so on, if he mentions anywhere that he read these books in English because they weren't translated till the 1920s, 100 years later, published in Buenos Aires. That was the main place for publishing them. Um, and looking at the translations, the translations are very good, actually, but they miss out big chunks. So there's a whole kind of theory of translation around those books. But I think Borges' first work on translate, correct me if I'm wrong, first work about, trans you know, Borges is very big in translation studies. Mm -hmm. So his Dos Maneras de Traducir, I think came out in eight, 1926. And he's saying, you know, there's this difference between romanticism and classicism in, in, um, in translating. I just wondered if he yeah, mentions Arnold anything. Newman, the Arnold Newman debate and all that was That's I, right. I, I, do, I do mention that to the thing, yeah. Well, I, don't, I, don't I, wonder, I wonder if he was probably. referring to these translations that are coming out of these, of these British travel texts, which were published in 1920, in 1921. Maybe you could, would you be able to send me a list? Because I'm not sure that I'm going to remember all these names. I don't think I know about this. He, he never mentions the, well, the translation. Noticed. Okay. I've not noticed. Um, okay. But if you give me, a, if you send me the list, that would be super. I think I think the most famous one is Rough Notes by Francis Bonhead, Galloping Head, they called him. Mm. Um, that's the most famous English one. But they were not translated to Spanish till the 1920s yeah. and published in Buenos Aires. So I'd be really surprised if he, if he didn't know about them. You know, so I was just wondering if mm. if if you come across it, but obviously not. No. I haven't, but oh, um, right. you know, okay. but, but if there is a reference to it, then you know, might follow it up. You know? <laughs> okay, I, I, will, I will. I'll do that. Yeah, I'll send you a list of the ones that were yeah. coming out then. Thanks. I don't know if Evelyn knows. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know if there are any other uh, comments or uh, points. Daniel. That... Daniel. Yes, there are. I'd like. Yes. I'd like yes. to make one. Yes. Okay. Please. Please. Thank you, Daniel. Great. Uh, I didn't know about your existence. I didn't know about your book. I found out today um, um, about you and the book. And I must say that I was particularly pleased to hear your interest in Thomas Brown. I think I mentioned your translation. Of, uh, there's a reference to your translation of um, was oh, it Pseudodoxia uh, Epidemica. Not having seen the book yet, I didn't know about it. I just want to mention to you its existence and the fact that I discover now that you wrote already for the Modern Languages uh, review in 1992 on mm -hmm. Brown and Borges. Yeah. I wish I had known about it because when I made my translation, I added an appendix on uh, Brown and Borges. And uh, of course, uh, I would have gained a lot had I seen the article. I have no, I... <laughs> very quickly looked at when um, uh, during your talk. These things but, happen, don't worry about it. Yeah. I look forward to being in touch with you. And uh, But I have, met, I have referenced you in my book. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very glad you did so. Just check that, but I'm pretty sure. That's true. I don't bother. It's all right. I, think that's yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know, Cynthia, if you want to just sort of rehearse some of the, the issues related to the Brown and the 
uh, it, you know, the, the uh, some of the, the the translations and sort of mistranslations or back oh, okay. Uh, right, right, right. Tell uh, that story and how you were involved in that because I, I think yeah, that. Yeah. Thomas Very, Brown sus errores vulgar, vulgares y pseudodoxia epidemica of reference to. Yeah, sorry, we'd like me to talk about I all mean, that. I, I think I think it'd be good to do that because I, I think that what it does is it brings um, a very personal dimension to the way to you know the, as it were the work of a scholar who's looking at mm -hmm. text etc. and then how they're translated and they're hunting down the sources etc. And how that all kind of comes together, but I don't know if you, if you, if you could. I mean, I know it is quite a complex story, but I wondered if it might be, I think, of, of interest to to the audience in case they didn't know about it. Uh, what you want to to go way back, do you, to nineteen eighty? Uh, um, well, it's just really to do. I think it's to more the more to do with the the. I mean, it could be that. Yes, it could be that. So given the, the whole context of it, but it's really the idea of of translations get it and mistranslations. And oh, that. sorry, the translations and oh, you mean the error? Yeah, the 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 interpolation. Yeah, yeah. There was I got caught up um, quite by accident. Um, I was I was. Um, you you may sometimes think that translation is a quiet place, but it's not always. And um, I got caught up by accident in this controversy um, um, because um, Borges and Boy Casares um, translated the fifth chapter of Urn Burial by um, um, Sir Thomas Brown, which is considered one of the, the absolutely most amazing pieces of writing in English for all time, you know. And uh, all, many, many of the great literary figures have admired um, this. And um, so, uh, you know, having discovered Brown and I was delving into it in obsessive fashion, this is in the 1980s, um, it was, I found it was very interesting because there seemed to be an extra paragraph that had appeared from somewhere. You see, so I thought that Borges, like great creative writer, was being creative. And I got a lot of egg on my face because I expressed this in, in a publication. Um, but it turned out that I wasn't the only one, and some extremely famous people, including Javier Marias, had done it. So the, the, then it became a big, and I think that Daniel Weisbein was sitting there chatting to us. I think that you weren't you the person that discovered our error or Marias's error, perhaps. We I was like, indeed. I was indeed. Yeah. I thought you were. So well done, you. Anyway, Bork is being such so clever at manipulating the world's um, publishing, you know, um, machinery, um, managed to create this net that caught a lot of us, even though I was caught, I'm kind of laughing now. Although for a long time, I wasn't laughing because if I ever put my name into Google with Borges, it came up about this error that I had made. So I thought, well, I've got to turn this into something positive. I can't just be flattened by it. So, uh, and then I discovered that the, the, the real experts on Sir Thomas Brown, and that's certainly not me, uh, in this Oxford book that came out, because he'd been ignored for decades, but a really important book came out. And then they made, they told the wee story of all these, these specialists who'd been caught in the net, including the Baroness, the one who edited the complete works in French, I think. Um, so, um, this story was out there. And then um, another person who got caught was um, uh, uh, Efrain Cristal, this, book, uh, the, this um, professor uh, who wrote this very excellent book about Borges and translation. And he got caught in a particularly entertaining fashion because he um, translated the, this um, Spanish back into what he thought was 17th century English. Um, but you see, the point was that actually Brown had written this little paragraph. Um, the apocryphal fra fragment is what um, Woods calls it, Gareth Woods calls it. And so Christel back translated it into 17th century, um, am I getting this right? Into what he thought was 17th century English, but it's really American version of 17th century English. And so, the, and he published this in his book called uh, the, the Invisible Work, you see, which is also a great title for a book about translation. And so the whole thing really became quite entertaining. 
Um, but I mean, it's amazing how things that don't really matter in that no one gets killed or anything can become so controversial, really, you know. But that's some um, academia and publishing for you. <laughs> I'm not sure if I've done, if I've described this very well, but uh, do you want to come in on it, Daniel? You, <laughs> you have inside oh, knowledge. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I was very interested to hear you say this. I didn't know about uh, Crystal's intervention. Uh, and uh, obviously I have a lot to uh, get updated on and what I'll do is uh, try to get in touch with you after this meeting and perhaps we can have a telephone conversation in which you can tell me all the little uh, appetizing tidbits. <laughs> well I think I've said everything I'm going to say in the book. I mean I've moved on from all that to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah and, ju and just to come back to that yeah I think that's that's also something else that, that may well be why it might persuade some of the readers to 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 purchase this book because uh, not only the discount which is 40 percent but what Cynthia <laughs> does is actually goes back to the past and says this is where something happened which was an error which was a, a, a completely understandable error by the way that it's it's presented we know that but then it led to these other errors that then led to a kind of uh, an interesting another story and what she does do is shows in fact actually this is the way that history is sometimes created um if, if we think of even where, like, you know, in languages, for example, the D in admiral should not be there. You know, it was put in there because uh, in the 17th century, people thought, well, admiral relates to the word, uh, Latin word admirare, but it didn't. It, it, it was it was another completely different word, I think, from Arabic. So that they so the important thing here is that that's an error stuck in the stuck in the language. Um, but to come back to that, that what uh, Cynthia then shows is the way that this is actually quite similar to the way that Borges plays with um, the uh, uh, plays with the world of literature, plays with history, and but I Steve, think that's an idea. Can I just say something, Steve? Because I forgot to say that the crucial thing was that Borges had moved this paragraph from a, a footnote, you know, to, in different editions, basically. Yeah. So the thing was created by Brown. Yes. Uh, yeah. No, that's that, moved. Borges moved it. Yeah. Borges moved it. Okay. Um, but I think that you hint as well, and perhaps I'm putting words in your mouth, uh, Cynthia, at this point. But my sense when I read that was that you were also, uh, there, there's also a sense in which when you interpreted what had happened as a result of Borges uh, making these, uh, the, the, these decisions, that actually it relates as well to something which is true about the creation of history, the true about the way that stories are made, etc. So that it's, uh, you know, sometimes it's difficult to kind of separate errors, which sometimes turned into something uh, true as well. And I think Evie was talking about, um, you know, in, 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 in terms of texts, which are uh, nothing, and, and all is the interpretation, as it were. So, you know, to come back to that point. So, you know, again, I think it's very interesting to see that story and, and you give that uh, uh, narrative to it. And, 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 and Daniel is also an actor within that particular narrative. And he may well want to find out a little bit more about the role that he played as well, which is, which is, which is fun. So it's very good to have Daniel here as well as you, of course, Cynthia, talking about your book. But just to say as well that there's lots and lots of nuggets in the book as well. There's lots and lots of details, which I think are very, very interesting. But it does have a story, as we've, as we've, as we've seen, um, of looking in a, and I think a very balanced way, um, at the relationship between the life and the work. Um, and also bearing in mind uh, that all biographies are themselves a shaping of a life, a linguistic shaping of that life. Um, and, you know, uh, so, so I think that's that's very important. Do we have any other um, comments or or views that we'd like to um, put forward? Has anyone got any other questions? Well, for when you're saying about all autobiography, in a way, this is a a, a way of life writing, isn't it? Yes, I I I, I think I I as yes. I mean, I'm I've uh, been working a bit on that recently myself, and I think that's right. Um, life scripting, I think that uh, um, is, 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 is a term that can be used to talk about that as well. But I think, 
as as you as you've mentioned there as well that, that it's always i mean hayden white was one of those historians wasn't it who mentioned that in fact history is written and it's not an objective uh, narrative of of of, uh, uh, of of facts or things that happen but actually is as much a narrative of or, uh, as it is a, a line of facts um but good no are there any other uh, comments, any uh, observations, questions that you, anyone would like to uh, raise at this point? Okay, uh, so that means that we would uh, we would be concluding four minutes early um, because we normally do that five minutes before the hour, so, so that uh, as we're, we're uh, it will be at twelve fifty one. So I'd like to say thank you so much again. Um, to Cynthia for a wonderful uh, presentation of her book, and I do commend this book to you. This is available, and you can, since you've been uh, you've been here today, you can get that forty percent discount. Um, there it is. There's the book, Borges the Enigma, a very very crucial way of looking at Borges. We've seen that today. I'd like also to thank so much Professor Evelyn Fishburne for her wonderful erudition and reading of this book, as you can see that this is this stands the test and there are lots of different ways of looking at Borges, but it, it really looks at that basic point of the relationship between um, life and work and shows Borges not being such a cold fish. Let's put it like that. There, there's something more to Borges. There's some emotions in there. He really is human after all. Um, and I'd also like to thank very much Jenny for her, it seems almost miraculous. Um, thank you so much again, uh, Jenny, for doing that. Uh, what would we have done without you uh, today? Uh, and so thank you very much to everyone for Stephen. coming along today. Um, and yes, thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank um, you. So I, I don't know if, if uh, Evelyn something? wanted to say something. Uh, yes, you I need to unmute. Okay, yes, yes. Of course. Have I unmuted? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, now. yeah. 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 There was just something about Borges and me that I was wanted to bring in so much and, uh, and forgot, but it's very much tied in with what you say about the, the emotional part of Borges. And that is that I, everybody, every Argentinian has a Borges and me story. And when I went to see Borges once, I wanted to ask him about subjectivity. And uh, in, in, in that, that you know that he was emotional, and so I sort of said about that he was that he was uh, I, something about emotional or something. But the thing is, to show his emotion, I told him a few things at the beginning of El Milagro Secreto, and he listened to me, and he had tears in his eyes when he finished when I finished telling him the resume of the story, and he said, "But I wrote that story." And he was, had tears in his own eyes about reading the emotion. So the emotion, he certainly was not algebra alone, but a lot of fuego there. Sorry to have brought this in, but I, I, I just wanted to. No. To un it underwrites, really, and, and, and no justification needed, but it somehow supports mm -hmm. Cynthia's look for the man. Good. No, I think that's right. I mean, that's definitely a, a story that dispels that horrible myth that we were told about. But with tears in his own eyes, and he says, but I wrote that book, that story. Uh, but I wrote that story. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, let's, let's just um, all, uh, if we can, clap uh, Cynthia, I think, for a very wonderful, uh, so thank you very much indeed, Cynthia. <laughs> That's absolutely wonderful. And well I think done. we should clap yeah. Stephen as well for this yeah. amazing sharing. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, thank you, Stephen, for doing this. Very okay. grateful. An absolute honour, a pleasure. So thank you very much indeed.